All right, good morning, everyone. I'm coming to you uh, bright and early on Tuesday morning, and I've got my assistant back here. She's going to be in the video today. Yeah. So um, anyway, I want to apologize for not getting those videos to you until 11 yesterday. I had it done at like 8, and it was sitting on the uh, in my YouTube studio, and it just never uploaded for some reason. So I promise this one will get out a lot quicker today. So Today we're going to cover two chapters. Normally we cover three. Today we're just getting two, but they're two huge ones, uh, two very important chapters. And really a lot of them become quite important as we get through the ending of this book, as we get closer and closer, because we're about, you know, a little bit over halfway there. So uh, our first one is kind of in line with what we talked about yesterday. And again, some of these conversations can become um, problematic in that it's going to go against the way some of you feel. All right. And I want you to understand something about my class and about some of the stuff you're going to see in college. You do not have to go along with things I say or believe. You are not only welcome, but encouraged to have your own beliefs. All I ask is that in any time when we're discussing these, whether it's in your questions or on your tests, if you have a disagreement to do exactly what most of you do and be very polite and respectful in how you disagree. That's kind of the goal here. All right. Because today, the 8th Tuesday, is called We Talk About Money. And um, but let's just say this is a tender subject. All right? uh, a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions about money. And uh, a lot of you are going to have different opinions than me. And I want you to understand that that's fine. And that I welcome those differences. Uh, some of my closest uh, friends <coughs> have very different opinions on me politically, uh, some religiously, uh, there's just a lot, and that's okay. I'm still friends with these people because we're more than our opinions, okay? <coughs> but our opinions do help make us, okay? And um, I've had a different life than you guys, some of you, most of you. Uh, I have different experiences, and my way of seeing the world may be different for a good reason. So as we get into this, and I discuss, and I'm discussing what is said in this chapter, all right, and kind of building on it. I'm not going to, you know, go off on a huge tangent, but I, I just want to prepare you because some of you may not totally agree with what I'm saying, and that's fine, all right? Okay, so it starts off with a quote from Ted Turner. It says, it's, it says I held up the newspaper so more he could see it. I don't want my tombstone to read. I never owned a network, okay? So this is about Ted Turner, who uh, is trying to buy up all of this, these TV networks back in this time period. Uh he says, and Maury, uh, not Maury, this is Mitch. He says, I wondered if Turner ever found himself in my old professor's position with his breath disappearing and his body turning to stone, his days being crossed off the calendar one by one. Would he really be crying over owning a network? They're pointing out that, you know, some of the, and we're going to build on this, okay? But the idea that, that some of the possessions that we strive so much for, if we're staring down the barrel of the end of our lives, we don't care about those things anymore. And the point is, is we shouldn't care about them before then. All right. If in your last days, all of your possessions, they're going to be forgotten, then why bother chasing them to begin with? OK. Um, so Maury's going to explain to Mitch why he thinks that people are so materialistic in our culture and people are materialistic all over the world. People that have the luxury of being that way. But it is a ingrained attitude in our country. Um, it is one of the negative things about us as a people is our obsession with stuff and having things. Uh, this is a really important paragraph. It says, we've got a form of brainwashing going on in our country, Maury side. Do you know how they brainwash people? They repeat something over and over. And that's what we do in this country. Owning things is good. More money is good. More property is good. More commercialism is good. More is good. More is good. We repeat it and have it repeated to us over and over until nobody bothers to even think otherwise. The average person is so fogged up by all this, he has no perspective on what's important really anymore. And going a little further, he says, uh, you know what I always interpreted this as? He's talking about people chasing things. He says these were people were so hungry for love that they were accepting substitutes. And he's talking about we find our substitutes and our stuff. Okay. Now, in the past, I've had kids read that and say, oh, you know, he's talking bad about our system, our economy, our economic beliefs. He's saying owning stuff is bad. Maury must be a, some sort of communist. Guys, I have to point out to you that there is more to it than capitalism and communism. There's, there's this huge range of other things that go into this, okay? And uh, 
you know, I don't feel like it's either I own lots of stuff and only care about possessions or I give everything away. I don't I, I don't feel like there's only those two options. And what more he's saying here is that the obsession with collecting stuff and owning more things is the problem. And we do have that. No sooner have you purchased a new game or phone or computer or car, you know, anything, then you've already started getting tired of it and wanting the next big thing. <coughs> um, it's, it's sad that we're this way. Um, and we become depressed if we can't own these things. I mean, we live in a co country with tons of resources where basically if you, if you really want to, no matter how bad off you are, you can find food to eat. And even in, in a lot of cases, if you know how to use the system, a place to live, it may not be the nicest, but that's okay. Um, we also live in a country where people get mad about these things. They're like, you know, if people don't work, they shouldn't be able to eat. That's, you know, that's also not right. Okay. So we have this, this, we get offended really quickly when people make comments like what Maury just made. That's one of the more controversial statements he makes in this book, in my opinion then people have a hard time swallowing it because we just, but there's a reason. He said we've been brainwashed and that's the exact reason we get so upset. We've been taught that the good thing is to collect as much stuff as you can have. I feel like this brainwashing is so powerful and strong in our country because it's, it seems to be even at the top levels of things like the Christian church with us feeling like owning stuff is so important. Um, <laughs> even though biblically we can look at the ch church in Acts and see a perfect example of why that is not what we should be after and how the Bible even encourages us not to be materialistic to a degree of, you know, uh, the church was, you know, getting a lot of, uh, of property and a lot of material from from these uh, parishioners. I don't say parishioners. They weren't called that back then, but they're members and they were helping distribute this back out. Now, no, that doesn't mean Mr. Morris is advocating for communism. Quit thinking those are your two options and that's it. There is this other option. Mr. Morris believes in the concept of capitalism. I like being able to own things. I also don't believe in my things owning me. And in our country, our things own us. And Maury believes it's because we're so desperate for love, we think we're gonna find it in possessions. I think it goes further than that. I think it's also in us thinking that um, if we have enough stuff, more people will care about us because then we look like we're important. You know, if you have the nicest car. Guys, everybody jokes around about how ratty my, my cars look. It's because I don't care. You know, um, it, they don't matter to me. They, they're a device to get me from my home to my job and to pick up my kid if I need to. That's it. They're not a status symbol for me. Um, would I like to have a nice car? For sure. Um, I, I don't like stressing over car issues, but I also don't think that having a nice car is in any way going to make me a better person. So this section really is talking about not owning things is bad. He's just saying that the desire for more is bad. You now being thankful for what you have and being, you know, and this is a time period where we're learning that. We're learning, thank God. We're learning. It's one of the benefits of, of situations like this when they come up is that you do become more focused on the important things. Now, maybe not some of us. Some of us are, are still very comfortable in our situations, but a lot of people who are struggling right now are learning the value of things like uh, of relationships. Because right now we're in a position where a lot of us are, are not are denied that. I mean, my relationships right now consist of my family, and that's it. And the occasional emails from you guys and texts from friends here and there. But as far as getting to sit down and have coffee with a friend. It's just not an option, all right? Okay, um, he goes on to, uh, Mitch kind of looks around Maury's study, and now Maury's a college professor, so he's doing fine, and his wife also is a college professor, so they're not struggling. <clears throat> but he looks around and he realizes that most of his stuff in his, in his room are, is old. You know, Maury has kept his old stuff because he doesn't see a need for new ones, all right? Uh, this is continuing. He says, there's big confusion in this country over what we want was where versus what we need, Maury said. You need food. You want a chocolate sundae. You have to be honest with yourself. You don't need the latest sports car. You don't need the biggest house. The truth is you don't get satisfaction from those things. You know what really gives you satisfaction? What? Offering others what you have to give. Okay. Again, people start to panic because he just said you don't need all of this stuff. A couple of days ago, a couple of videos ago, I told you guys that. It may have been yesterday's. I told you that it's a lie to think that supporting yourself means a six-figure bank account, 
you know, the newest car, the newest cell phone, and the most expensive house. That is not supporting yourself. That is spoiling yourself. All right. But again, people automatically, they're very defensive about that. They get very defensive because it sounds like you're advocating for, um, again, for socialism and communism. And that's not what I'm doing right now. I can promise you that's not the case. What I'm advocating for is being less selfish and less materialistic and, you know, enjoying the things that you have and that you can and, and, and getting the most out of that. And that's what Maury's saying here in that section. He's arguing that uh, I'm back at it. He's saying that, you know, we, we get confused between what we want and what we need. All right. You know, you need to eat. You don't need to go out to eat four times a week and spend 80 bucks for a family of four to go out and eat. <clears throat> you don't need to have the fanciest best car um you don't need to have you know if there's i've never understood this you know you got mom and dad and they got one kid so three people in family mom and dad hopefully are, are in a room together and the kid so that's two bedrooms why do you have a six bedroom house what are you doing because you can i mean that's stupid that, that kind of stuff is what we're talking about. And then what we're saying, it just isn't worth it. You know, there's no reason to keep reaching for all of this stuff. He says, in actuality, happiness is not found in stuff. It's found in giving things away. He doesn't mean go take all your stuff and give it away. Although I don't have a problem if he does say that. All right. I mean, you know, yes, Mr. Morse isn't emptying out his house and giving things away. But I also don't think that if he was to say that, he would be wrong. I mean, we do see precedents for that in the Bible about giving things away. And what it comes down to is that if your stuff is in the way of you having a good relationship with your family or with God, then it needs to go. Okay. But he's saying he's advocating here for us to stop reaching for all this stuff and letting it own us and to, you know, actually, uh, give away the gifts we've been given by, and by that, I don't mean that actually, in fact, he doesn't talk about just actually like giving away your TV. He's talking about your time and your abilities. Okay. One of the, some of the best churches I've seen in this country are ones that operate on a tithing system that operates like this. Okay, so you've got, maybe you don't have money, uh, a lot of money to pay your bills, let alone give a bunch to the church. You know, you're, you're at, you work at an oil change place and you barely make minimum wage. So some of these churches that I've been a part of even, I was part of one of these in Savannah that did this and they had, a, they called it a relational tithe. And what they would do was you were an oil change person. Once a month, they would base, the church would buy supplies and all these, there was three or four guys that worked for these oil places and they would come and on Sunday afternoon, they would change the oil for the older ladies uh, and gentlemen in the church who just either couldn't afford to or were just older and just, it wasn't possible for them. So these guys were doing the church paid for it and it was free of charge. And the men volunteered their time and the church paid for the supplies from ties where people did donate money. And for a lot of people, this is just as valuable, all right? Um, you know, if you're a carpenter, and, and Cottage Hill's good about this. You, know, you can, we've got a lot of people in the in the congregation who are good at certain like hands-on skills. I've worked with a painting crew. I've learned a lot about painting by working with them, and they go and do. They've painted a lot around the school um, and done things like that, and they do it free of charge. And uh, that's very expensive work, trust me. So um, little things like that, and I'll tell you, when I've been able to do those types of things, it's I leave so much more fulfilled. Than if I've gone and bought a new uh, new album I really wanted. I mean, going out and doing things for others is how we feel alive. Um, and we all have abilities and talents that we can share with others. And Maury's saying that's what you need to focus on. Um, he says, there are plenty of places to do this. You don't need to have a big talent. There are lonely people in hospitals and shelters who only want some companionship. You play cards with a lonely older man and you find new respect for yourself because you are needed. So you don't even have to be a person who has a, a skill like that. Just being with people who don't have others is, is a way to do this. Um, he says in that, in that you become valuable through that, not through your car. So remember what I said about finding a meaningful life? I wrote it down, but now I can recite it. Devote yourself to loving others. Devote yourself to your community around you and devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. You noticed he added grinning. There's nothing in there about a salary. And uh, if I could tell you to take anything out of this book, one paragraph, and keep it with you the rest of your life. That's the one I would tell you to take. All right. Money's a tool. It should not be the, it's a means, not an end. Okay. The goal is not, and I always, when I was first working as a youth minister, it always terrified me when I'd ask kids, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. I just want to be a millionaire, though. Being a millionaire is a way to, 
is the resources to do something. It's not the end of the goal. The goal shouldn't be to have a, a fat bank account. It should be to have money so that you can now use that money to do what? Are you going to do selfish things with it? Are you going to have that yacht you always wanted? Or are you going to use it to you know help pay for uh, pay for a uh, struggling school district to have schools? I mean to have to schools to have computers for their schools. Right? I mean, what what is your goal with this stuff? And Maury sums it up in real simple language. He said you should devote yourself to three things. Uh, loving others, your community around you, and creating something that gives you purpose. And you can disagree with a lot of things I've said in this chapter. That's not one of them. Guys, that one's not up for argument. Tell me why those three things are not what we should be striving for. Especially if you're a Christian and you, you claim to be a follower of Jesus. Then those three things are dead on in line with what we should be doing as Christians. And yes, there's nothing in there about a salary. Yeah. The salary allows you maybe to carry out those things sometimes, but it should be used as a tool. And it should never become the focus of your life. Um, he says also, Mitch, if you're trying to show off for people at the top, forget it. They will look down on you anyhow. And if you're trying to show off for the people at the bottom, forget it. They will only envy you. Status will get you nowhere. Only an open heart will allow you to float equally between everyone. And that, again, that applies directly to you guys even in a, uh, in a, as teenagers. Think about it. If you're trying to show off, the people who are like the cool people who maybe you're not part of that crowd, they're not going to be impressed when you try to show off. Uh, they're, they're still going to think, well, you know, so-and-so's got a nice car, good for them. They're still going to talk about you behind your back. And the kids that are feel like they're being picked on by you or your group are, st are just going to hate you more. So the only way you can really be accepted by others is to be a caring and loving person. That's how you move freely between groups. That's how you have friends, uh, real friends is by being a person of concern for others. I told you there was a lot in this chapter. It says, uh, giving to other people is what makes me feel alive. Not my car or my house, not what I look like in the mirror. When I give my time, when I can when I can make someone smile after they were feeling sad, it's as close to healthy as I ever feel. And uh, I get that. Um, I'm, I'm temporarily happy when I get things like a new game or a new CD to listen to. Um, I'm joyful which is not a temporary thing joyful is an attitude and it's it's something that carries out for it's, it's a bigger picture thing happiness is low happiness is is momentary happiness is situation based joyfulness is something that's more about your attitude and your view on life and my joyfulness comes from the emails i get from you guys i got one yesterday uh i'm gonna use the student's name i didn't ask their permission and i really probably shouldn't but um, i want this person to know how much they mean to me i got i've gotten a couple of emails actually from uh one of you 10th graders from Sophie Lynch, who uh, those I have saved them and put them um, up on my mirror um, back in the back or near my mirror in the back to help me look at in the mornings when I get up and I'm like, I don't feel like doing it today. This isn't what I want. You know, and I've thought about throwing in the towel multiple times because of, you know, health reasons and some other stuff. But I'll see those notes and, I'm, and the things that this that she has said. I'm like, no, I've, I've got to tough it out because that's when I feel good about myself. That's when I feel like, you know, I had a purpose on this planet is when I get those types of emails. And several of you have emailed me stuff too. Uh, I was just thinking of hers particularly because of, of what she said in them. So, um, you know, Maury's dead on. This chapter closes with, and Mitch Album obviously really starts to develop this strong sense of writing ability uh, as um, this book goes. It, it feels like this is a new writer coming into his own um, because he's got such great, powerful little quips and things that kind of keep, you know, it gets really serious and he throws in some humor because this chapter ends with this Ted Turner guy, Maury said, he couldn't think of anything else for his tombstone. And that's, his tombstone was going to say, I, I didn't want to die thinking, or never owning a network. And he's like, of all the things you could have put, that's all he could come up with for a guy with all the resources and all the wealth in the world. That was what he was thinking of. And it points to us that it's not, the poor people or the people who don't have all this stuff, whose lives are empty. It's the upper upper class way up there at the top people, not all of them now, but the ones who think their possessions give them meaning. He says, those are the ones who are actually empty. Pretty, pretty harsh statement, but there's a lot of truth in it. Okay. All right. Sorry. There's the 20 minutes on that one chapter. So we're going to kind of breeze through the next one, but it's just as important in a lot of ways. Okay. The ninth Tuesday is called We Talk About How Love Goes On. And this is another one that really starts developing the sadness angle of this story. All right. He starts off with a paragraph about the O.J. Simpson trial, which is going on during this time. Um, that's going to come up a couple of times in the book. So just know that's one of those unifying, like, transitional statements that brings pieces of the story together. All right. Uh, 
he also talks about some other like horrible things just happening in the world. This is a this is a good writing technique. It also brings up uh, that Mitch has been trying to contact his brother in Spain is having no luck. That's also a really important like unifying factor. All right. Um, we also talk about the Nightline people wanting to come back and visit, but Mitch kind of catches on that they're holding off because they want to get Maury like as close to the end as they can. And Mitch is really offended by that. But Maury points out, look, I've used them to get get my message out, and they're using me to get ratings. It's really kind of a win-win for both of us. Don't feel that. But he points out to Mitch, he says, you and I have to go on. All right. He's like, we don't have time to think about that. This is our last thesis together, you know, our last thesis. And for them, a thesis isn't like a thesis for you. A thesis for you is a sentence that you write that tells you meaning. A thesis here is kind of like a huge idea. I mean, they actually mean the same thing. Um, yours is a sentence. Theirs would be in a paper. Or to be honest with you, as we're going to find out later, it's this book. That is what the result of all these sessions was this book, all right, which you should have probably figured out, to be honest. Um, he says, here we were doing the same thing once more, starting with an idea. A dying man talks to a living man, tells him what he should know. This time I was in less of a hurry to finish. You know, he re thinks back to uh, when he was in school with Maury and he worked on a thesis with him then. And he was in a hurry to get done. He says, this time I'm not. Because, guys, you know what the ending of this would be. This is over when Maury's done, when he's dead. Um, he's talking about a question. Maury's talking about a question he was asked. He says, I was quest if I was worried about being forgotten after I died. Well, do you? That's Mitch asking him. He says, no, I don't think I will be. I've got so many people who have been involved with me in close, intimate ways, and love is how you stay alive even after you're gone. And Maury points out, I don't think I will be forgotten. He says, I have so many people that love me and that I've invested in that I'm going to be a part of their lives even after I'm gone. And he points out to Mitch, he says, look, he says, when you're not with me, do you sometimes hear my voice or think about me? And Mitch is like, yeah. He says, so there you go. That's how I know I won't be forgotten, which that's such a powerful thing. And that's a thing that <coughs> teachers and uh, mentors have that they can really hang, hang their hat on. Because, you know, you do realize that maybe not all the time, you know, it may go years where some, some of you who I was close to won't think, you're not going to think about Mr. Morris every September when school starts. But every once in a while, you'll see something. You'll be like, oh, I, I mean, it reminds me of that teacher I had. Hey, you may forget my face and you may forget my name, but still the ideas maybe can stay. And that's a way to live on. Um, Maury starts talking about what he wants on his own tombstone now, because we were talking about the Ted Turner's tombstone before. Now he says about his own. And he says he wants, very simple, he says, I want it to say a teacher to the last. And uh, that's a really interesting uh, thing to put on there. You know, it shows you how much he values what he did. And not just that his teaching in his classroom, but his teaching in life. And we're going to find out that so many people have been who never knew this man have been impacted by this book. I mean, I'm one of them. Um, okay, and then we've talked about. There's another section here. It's kind of the ending of this. Uh, it's not the ending. There's actually another section I forgot about. But um, Maury starts talking about the importance of being with people when you're with people. He talks about the importance of listening to people, truly listening. In fact, he taught a class on it. Mitch points out that you know. How, how do you teach a class on paying attention? That's stupid. The fact is, is that most of you don't. Even my best students, I can look around my classroom and we're talking, guys, I have you for 55 minutes. Subtract the first five to 10 minutes when we're just getting class going because I don't get started right away. So let's say we're down to 45 minutes. Take out the last five minutes because, you know, we, always, we, we don't usually go to the bell. Excuse me, that's 40 minutes. Take your 40 minutes, subtract about 10 to 15 for interruptions that come up. So now we're down to, let's say, 25 minutes of class where I'm actually speaking to you. Most of you cannot pay attention for that whole 25, 25 minutes. Um, even the good students, you know, your mind goes somewhere else. You know, half of you are working on other work. I see it constantly. Chemistry in the mornings, uh, at the end of the day, it's different things, but chemistry always, at second period, it's chemistry that you're working on. <clears throat> and then in the afternoon, sometimes it's math or something that you have homework coming up that you don't feel like doing, so you're working on that. Or it's on the phones, uh, constantly distracted. And I used to be offended by it and take it personal. Now I just realize that's, uh, well, no, I used to get offended. Then I transitioned to, well, you guys just can't help it. I know that's neither of those are true. I don't think it's personal. I also know you can take control of yourselves and not. I, this, this teenagers have a bad attention span, just can't help it is, is nonsense. Okay, you can. Um, what I've taken it to now is it's just, you, you, this is how people are. Um, but that doesn't mean that's how we have to be and we can change. Maury talks about the importance of that, that, how he says, you know, I've, I pay attention to who's there. Um, 
Because I remember how he used to teach this. This is Mitch talking. I remember how he used to teach this idea in the group process class back at Brandeis. I had scoffed back then thinking this was hardly a lesson plan for a university course, learning to pay attention. How important could that be? I know. I now know that it's more important than almost everything they taught us in college. Think about that. Uh, he says the most important thing they've had in college is learning to pay attention. Um, and you do have to learn it. You do have to learn to give people your attention. Um, it's not easy for a lot of us. Uh, but really key part of is part of the problem, Mitch, is that everyone is in such a hurry, Maury said. People haven't found meaning in their lives, so they're running all over the time looking for it. They think the next car, the next house, the next job, then they find those things are empty too, and they keep running. And once you start running, it's hard to slow yourself down. He says, and that's why we have a hard time paying attention, because we're so wrapped up in our own stuff. We're so wrapped up in doing what we want and getting what we want, and we even treat people like they're – instead of treating your money like a resource, you're treating people like they're want. Instead of my money as a tool to get me a place, you treat people as they're the tool to get you to what you want. And so if they're talking about their day or the struggles they're having and that doesn't Im impact what you want and your goals, you kind of zone out. And that's 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 awful. You know, when I started wanting to teach in college, I, I realized that a lot of times in college, kids are closer to their career world and they know what's coming and they know what's important. And they tend to pay attention more in that case. It's hard to convince a 10th grader that it's important to learn how to write an essay because at that point, they're not even thinking about graduating high school. To them, that's still far off. And so, you know, as you get further along, teaching seniors is often, in, at least the beginning of the year, easier because you can put that context there. And, you know, when I was at Auburn and I was a senior and I was doing some TA work for some of my professors, so I would teach some of the freshman classes, those kids are even closer to the real world. So it's easier for them to pay attention because at that point, me as a teacher, it, I'm a resource to them and they feel like they can use me to get what they want. Maury's saying we should get past that and pay attention to people because we care about them. You know, you might hate math class, but you should pay attention in that math class and get everything you can out of it. Not because of a grade, but because you respect that teacher or because, you know, you know the, how much effort this person's putting into it and you, you love them for that. All right. Um, and then Maury tells a funny story about in traffic, you know, where, where the worst of us comes out, you know, when we're in a traffic situation and someone cuts you off and, you know, you start cussing and flipping them off and doing all sorts of other ridiculous things. Maury says he'll raise his hand and the person, you know, you've got to think they think this old man's about to flip them off and he'll wave at him and smile. And not in that condescending way that you're trying to aggravate them. He does it in a caring, loving way. And that is so interesting because he says not most of the time the person will smile and wave back. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you before. I'm going to tell you I have plenty of times where I've been in traffic and someone's done something that made me mad. And we get to the stoplight and I pull up next to him and I just give him that look like, you know, I want to find Guys, I look pretty intimidating sitting down. I mean, they don't know I'm, I'm a little fat midget guy. Just just this part, especially without the glasses, uh, it doesn't scream nice guy to a lot of people. But I pull up to little old men or little old, it's usually an older person, little old lady. And they look at you and they just smile and it just completely takes away that anger because you're like, how can I be mad at this person? And that's what Maury's saying. And he's like, you know, it if you can just get people to slow down and enjoy what they have and not be in such a hurry, it's amazing how much it impacts our lives. Um, the last part of this section is another really disturbing one. I told you that Maury's got a really tragic life. The last part of this, and we don't have to go over this a lot. You, you read it, hopefully, is about his dad's death. And what a horrible story. Um, what a horrible story. I want to encourage you. If you didn't, I'm not going to go over it. I want to. But I want you to go back and look at it and read it because the writing is really powerful. Um, it talks about what happened to his dad and how that impacted Maury and how it changed how he felt about things. Um, that will end us today right at 30 minutes. Um, tomorrow, we're going to get into starting to get to the tail end. We've got, now we're down to that. You know, we've, we've made a pretty big dent. Uh, we're getting to the tail end of this, guys, and the last little bit's a lot harder to discuss. Uh, the message is strong. Uh, the writing is even stronger, but the to talk about it is hard. Um, each year, this book gets harder to talk about. Uh, it come, becomes more and more powerful to me, but it gets harder and harder to talk about because, um, you know, you, when I was a young teacher and I was just starting out, I was still at that, you know, I'm going to work here for a little while, then I'm going to move on and do this. And, you know, you had this whole career path, or I had this whole career path mapped out. And, uh, you know, I, I, there was always more time to think about. And, you know, as I've gotten older, uh, 
you start to realize that that career path was a pipe dream and it really wasn't even what God intended for you. And you realize, hey, I'm kind of in what I'm supposed to be. And uh, this is this is this is what it, it, it this is where God intends me to be. And uh, this th- the idea that I'm going to do this really well so I can move on to the next stage is no longer a part of it. And you realize that the relationships, not the job are what matters. And you realize that they they end like they did for Maury. And you start thinking about your own mortality more and more and it just becomes a, a harder book to tackle. Um, but uh I love talking about it, and I'm excited about the rest of this week getting to go over this with you, all right? So I hope today wasn't too much. I know it's 30 minutes, and I know a lot of you are busy people, um, but I hope that you can take something of it. I hope you watch this because the discussion about the money particularly is one that I want you guys to all take with you as you move to these next stages of your life. Yes, get a job that will make you the money that you need, but the money that you need to help you do what you want, what God intends you to be. And God never intended you to be a, a number on a bank account. God intended you to be a person out there doing for others and sharing the gifts he's given you. The money is how you do that. Do not let it become, don't let it own you. Never let your stuff own you. You be in charge of your stuff. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you for your time today. I hope you have a great Tuesday. Um, Stay safe. Stay sane. I love all of you.